Well, thanks everybody. It's great to see so many people here on uh, such a rainy day. So that's great. I appreciate you making making the trip. I want to thank Todd especially um, for all the work and everybody for all the work in getting all this ready. And thank the Heritage Association, not just for today, but um, for the great work. Um, I, Bishop Hill definitely has a special place in my heart um, as um, completing my degree at Augustana, I was here often and then doing an internship leading into my uh, to, uh, grad school. And so it was great to be able to stroll around a little bit with the family and see um, how vibrant and great everything looks. And that's definitely a testament to the volunteers and the work of the heritage. So, um, so thank you for that. I also want to say thank you to the Galesburg Community Foundation for supporting um, this event. So. Um, to, to begin with, and Todd, we can go to the next slide. I do want to, you know, lower expectations. That's a secret to giving talks. I want to give a disclaimer that I am not a professional historian. This is not a thing I do um, every day. And I also want to say not just that, um, not just that a, a disclaimer for me, but I also think there is a special place in our society for actual professional historians who do the work of studying and deeply understanding where we've been to help us see where we're going to go. And so um, I, I want to give a shout out to um, John Wagner and Lily Sutterdahl and Adam Call and John Norton, who are part of this um, uh, speaker series, because they have done deeper work that I'm basing a lot of my work on. And I want to acknowledge their work. And just as a commercial, no one's paying me to do this. I'm super excited for Lily Sutterdahl's new book. Um, she has done so much excellent work in transcribing um, letters from Swedish into English for people like me that don't speak Swedish that are trying to study the history of Bishop Hill. That is so, so vital. And then just final special thanks. I want to give a mention to Dr. Myron Fogdi, who actually just passed away this last year. He was a, one of my mentors, but he was on the Heritage Association for many years and really helped push the scholarship of Bishop, of Bishop Hill. And um, I want to just give a shout out. He connected me with the Heritage to do my internship here. Um, and is really excellent. And last but not least is Dr. Lendl Calder, who's actually in the audience. He was my advisor during this research. And I said to him before this presentation started, some of my most meaningful moments as a scholar were in his office just talking one-on-one -on -one about new things that I discovered in the archives. So thank you for coming today, Dr. Calder. And um, thank you for your, uh, your mentorship for sure. So, Okay, uh, next slide. So I want to start, this is a weird place maybe, um, with an with a article that was written um, for Augustana College's uh, 150th anniversary by a friend of mine, Jamie Nelson, who's actually the special collections librarian at DePaul University. Um, she's a great librarian, but she wrote, like, why did Augustana end up in Rock Island? Why Rock Island? And she talked, and it was all very historically factual, very accurate. Um, it was, you know, why do they come from Paxton and looking for a community? And it was really striking to me that Bishop Hill never came up in this essay, and which is not a knock on um, Jamie's excellent work, <laughs> um, because all through um, Augustana's 150th anniversary um, celebration, I never saw Bishop Hill at all, um, which um, brought some, some questions into my mind. So, and we go to the next slide. When, when the King and Queen of Sweden came um, to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the great immigration from Sweden to the United States, there were two places they stopped in Western Illinois. I mean, there's probably more than two, but two key places, right? One was at Augustana, and I was there. And we laughed because our student body presidents gave them sweatshirts, gave the King and Queen of Sweden Augustana sweatshirts, which is what you would give to royalty when they visit your <laughs> campus. And the second place they stopped, of course, was Bishop Hill. Um, and so these are always two institutions. Sometimes I'm, I'm very happy to see these institutions are actually um, in conversation much more now than they had been um, at some times in the past. But so this is my argument, let me go to the next slide, that um, Bishop Hill represents um, this foothold for Swedish American immigration, but also it, it carried forward debates. And some of those debates were, are still with us today. Um, and it represents a kind of diversity that I think gets underplayed once in a while in the traditional um, way we think about this, our area and this immigration, right? This, that it wasn't all just this monolithic people that came and made the move, but there were debates happening um, as they settled this prairie that impacted where you lived, how you lived, and how you saw yourself, your own identity, as a Swede that was becoming an American. Um, and I also don't want to forget, um, there is so many unique things about Bishop Hill 
that we need to celebrate and study. There's also some things that are not unique to the immigration story that are any, of course, every immigrant group that comes over is, has its unique aspects. But um, there's also um, a standard story that happens. And definitely the Swedes that came um, over follow some of that process, that's for sure. Some of the so unique and not unique. So to take a step back, get a drink of water. The backdrop of Bishop Hill, I want to go all the way back to 1804. Um, and it was the Treaty of St. Louis that made, that gave this land to the United States, gave this land. Um, it was, this is a treaty between um, several Native American tribes and the United States government. Um, it's very controversial. There was alcohol involved. There were people that signed the treaty that is questionable if they actually had the authority to sign the treaty. And then this eventually, in, I, I, I totally stole this map, but you can see that this includes um, the land where Bishop Hill is all the way up into southern Wisconsin. So this is how this land that we are on today became part of the United States. The next slide. And of course, by 1832, the, the Sauk Fox Indians had sort of had enough. Um, they were getting pushed off their land. Um, their corn was getting taken by Europeans that were coming in. And that's when Black Hawk finally, you know, with the Black Hawk War happened, and that was in 1832. In, um, in Stoneberg's history from 1905, he talks about the first um, settlers to come to Weller Township, and that was in 1836, right? So the war was in 1832. First settlers here was in 1836, right? So um, that war pushed the, the final Native Americans out of this area into Iowa um, and opened up the, the settlement uh, to come. Um, meanwhile, back in Sweden, um, the Lutheran Church of Sweden was essentially a de facto branch of the Swedish government. So if you wanted to do certain things in society, you'd have um, approval from your pastor, you'd ha had to take communion, different rules. If you wanted to travel, there, sometimes there were signatures required from, from your pastors. Um, and there was a, a movement against this, a grassroots movement, there were a reader movement is what they were often called, where um, uh, people would gather in houses and read the Bible, which doesn't seem that um, radical today. Uh, but at that time, you weren't supposed to do that without your minister to be there to guide you, right, to offer guidance. And so it was this very um, grassroots um, movement of the people um, looking for, there's a big influence of Methodism and um, uh, Wesley's influences all over it, looking for um, striving toward uh, perfectionism. They wanted this authentic Christian experience. And this is, so this is where the Jansenist movement comes from, right? Is that these um, revolts against the Lutheran church looking for this authentic Christianity. What does it mean to be Christian? Um, George Scott, who was actually an Englishman, was uh, preaching across Sweden. He was eventually asked to leave Sweden. Um, but there's really strong evidence that um, Scott's influence over Jansen and the reader movement um, was very significant, and that helped build up uh, these followers. So um, for a while, they were tolerated, and then some, they became less tolerated, which we'll talk about. Also in Sweden, um, this idea of America eventually became implanted around that same time, the early 1840s. Um, Robert Baird did a tour, and he really sold America as this land of, of course, opportunity, religious freedom. Um, and, and you had this time in Sweden, right, where you had this country that was really locked in, a small country. Um, today, the population of Sweden is not that much different than the population of Illinois. I don't know what it was back then, so forgive me. Um, but you had this, you know, inc better nutrition, um, slightly better medicine. So people were living longer on the same amount of land. So you had this population that needed to go somewhere. And by 1847, um, which is after the colony was founded, but it did impact many Swedes that came over, um, Baird's book, Religious Freedom in the United States, was published, um, translated over into Swedish. And that really sparked um, a lot of the, the uh, immigration that happened. So this idea of what America was, was in the consciousness of Sweden, of the Swedes, and definitely the Swedes that came over. So they, and I, this might be me making a little jump, but I don't think it's um, a, a, too much of a stretch to say they were joining they, they, a, a project, right, of what was this land, what was this land to become. Um, yeah, and so then back here in the United States, uh, is the, the uh, commonly called the Second Great Awakening, right? So this was a religious movement. Again, another grassroots movement, which um, is interesting how it connects in with some of the conversations in Sweden, um, growth of Methodist and Baptist denominations, but really moving away from the ceremonial focus of, of, of um, Protestantism at that time. 
And again, this is where I get in tr trouble as not a professional historian because this is not my area. I'm just, again, dabbling. There's people that focus in on this. But this is um, where was in the consciousness of Americans as they're moving over. So the, the tent revival churches were, you know, pastors preaching across, across uh, the, the landscape, right? That was happening um, prior to their arrival. And there's a debate. We go to the next slide, Todd. If, is there a third great awakening or not? Maybe, maybe there isn't, but uh, a move toward more um, Adventist Pen Pentecostal, seeing um, the end times on the way and preparing the way, right? This um, more uh, fiery preaching, which um, was on the way in the 1850s. And whether that's real or not, I don't know, but um, you can talk, to, see William uh, McLaughlin's source. Uh, He's making that argument, and uh, I think it's an interesting argument uh, for sure. So again, right, that's the setup that we're seeing um, for what's happening in the thought here in the, in the U.S. as um, the Swedes come over to Bishop Hill. Very locally, and I, I love this history. This is such great work by Ron Nelson. Um, Henry County had great speculation, land speculation, and, and it didn't go well. <laughs> there, were, there were more speculation than, than the population could support, so the population of Henry County was actually depressed. So there were these colonies, um, some of them even exist as towns today, some of them don't, but Andover, Geneseo, LaGrange, Morristown, and Wethersfield. I know some of you live in those towns. Um, and so what would happen, right, is that you'd have these East Coast folks, they'd buy land, and you would buy shares of this company. And you could do one or two things with your shares. You could take the shares, you could move and expect to live on that land and that you would um, start this town or you would hope to sell it, right? And there's a lot of speculation. A lot of people bought shares hoping to make money. And um, uh, Henry County had one of the highest concentrations of this speculation. Um, and so the, the, uh, the population, and it didn't go very well, and so the population of Henry County was actually um, smaller than um, counties around it, right? Because there was other land available and they didn't move into these towns. And since um, LaGrange, Illinois today is a suburb of Chicago, not a part of Henry County, you, that's kind of a testament on how successful some of these um, colonies were. So, so the lands that we're going to be talking about, I'm sure everyone in this room probably knows this, but just in case, for the people watching on YouTube at home, um, you know, at the very bottom of the map, this is, I know, probably hard to see, but Victoria, it barely makes the bottom of the map. We'll be talking about Victoria. We're here in Weller Township and Bishop Hill. Up in Andover Township is, is uh, where um, Augustana Church was founded by Esbjorn. And then, of course, Rock Island and Moline is going to be um, another part, too. So this is the area that we're, I'm interested today. So this is the setup for Bishop Hill, right? You had Native Americans pushed out and um, the Swedes and us today, frankly, benefiting from that. Um, affordable land with a consciousness about what is America to be and religious debates happening when they arrive. And, you know, spoiler, um, by 1860, uh, Bishop Hill controlled like 11,000 acres and was one of the strongest labor forces, right, in, in the area. And so those are the pieces that, that came together. So. so just an overview of Bishop Hill history for those of you that maybe haven't been here for a while. And that, uh, or I'm sure some of you know this inside and out. And let me just also say um, on the Heritage um, YouTube channel, John Wagner's talk uh, from a couple months ago and Lily Sederdahl's talk are just fantastic. They really do a super deep dive into the history of Bishop Hill deeper than um, I'm gonna go and just great. I, I hate to say how many times I've watched them. I enjoyed it quite a bit. So I wanna encourage you to take a look at those. So, so again, Bishop Hill, the significance is this foothold of, of Swedish um, immigration, right? But to me, the biggest thing that, that sometimes we don't talk about is Bishop Hill is part of a larger argument about what the meaning of salvation is. And that is an argument that started in Sweden and then came over to the United States, um, which I will explore in a second. So we'll go to the next slide. So just the Bishop Hill history run through, right? In, uh, before they came over, the Jansenists were part of this devotionalist, pietist uh, movement. Um, really a, a revolt against the Swedish Lutheran Church in so many ways. They were, Jansen came um, out, he was a farmer, um, and very um, attracted a following, and you know, they, they were rough, like they burnt Luther's catechism, the Bible was the only way, um, they, they were, they split up families, like they were definitely um, not a group seeking moderation, right, they were 
um, had their belief, they had their prophet, and they were seeking um, a new salvation. So um, they, they broke away from the Lutheran church. And the important thing, right, is that they, they, they wanted to find a way for all of their members to come over. So this is where the communal living came from. So they, they lived with everything in common. They had some people that definitely could not afford the trip on their own. They had people that could. So everyone put their money together and made sure everyone got over. So this was a kind of communism out of um, necessity, um, not maybe out of philosophy. Um, the Headstrom Gateway. So it is interesting to think about the impact of how a few people can impact history in some significant ways. And I would say Olaf and Jonas Hedstrom are two of those people. So um, they were Swedish immigrants that came over early. So Olaf came over in 1829, studying my own notes, uh, became a Methodist minister. So again, that breakaway from the Swedish Lutheran Church. Um, ran the Bethel ship, which was a ship that never sailed, but was in the harbor of of New York City and um, all kinds of Scandinavians, not just Swedes, but also Norwegians would come through the, the Bethel, Bethel ship as a stopover point before they found new land um, in the West. And the Swedes and Bishop Hill definitely did that. They came to the Bethel ship um, and they, they went through the, you know, the canals across the Great Lakes, landed in Chicago, and then walked um, to, to here. So last night, my family and I drove in um, in the evening, a couple hour drive from Chicago. You know, this was a walk that they did over weeks with ox and carts, and I, I just can't even imagine what, what that trek uh, was like. Um, but anyway, sorry, off, I get myself off track. The, um, Jonah, Olaf's brother Jonas came over and um, fell in love and was married, became a Methodist also, and um, Jonas's wife's family moved to Victoria, and that was the first step of the, the Swedish step into our area, and that's where um, the Bishop Hill immigrants came first. So, you know, if, if Jonas's in-laws would have been to Alabama or to Mississippi or to Missouri. Who knows where we would be, right? Like, you know, when my, my um, family came over, um, not as part of Bishop Hill, but they came to Moline in the Quad City area on purpose, right? Because there were Swedes here. So if all those Swedes were in Texas, maybe, you know, we would all be in Texas talking to each other. I don't know. Um, but it's, it's interesting. And, I, you know, there's these debates. Dr. Calder can offer us some thoughts on this later, maybe. You know, what is the impact of individuals on history and how much of history is a larger mass kind of movement? And it's interest. I think a lot about what the, what the Headstroms did and how they built this area, right? So anyway, um, so back to Bishop Hill. Once they got over here um, and they started, of course, when you come to, you know, you don't go across the Atlantic in the winter. You don't, you know, it'd be nice um, where you could just arrive in the spring and plant your crops. Um, they left Sweden in the spring and um, early summer. They come to uh, Bishop Hill. They, they come here by, you know, the end of summer. There's not time to, to plant crops. And so that first winter was very rough, right? And where the baseball diamond is now was where the dugouts were. And they would be pulling out the bodies of old people who had died, sick people every morning, a really rough, rough winter um, to try to get by. And I can't even imagine what that would be like. So living in essentially tents with maybe some wood frame dug into into, I mean, I get sick enough of Illinois winter. I'm not living in a side of a hill with a tent over top of me, right? And so um, how challenging and difficult. But with that being said, um, they went right to work. Once, once spring came, they started to build and they started to grow. And you know, if you're a farmer in Sweden, that's hard, it's rocky, rough land. But in Illinois, you can throw some seeds over your shoulder and they start to grow with some of the greatest you know, farmland in the world. So the Swedes were, you know, this was great. And once they got going, of course, further challenges in 1849, there was a major cholera epidemic that actually um, uh, took the life of Eric Jansen's wife. Um, Jansen tried to escape and went to um, uh, what's today Arsenal Island to get away, but didn't, it didn't work, uh, didn't get away. But really, you know, really major impact with the cholera outbreak. And of course, as the Jansenist faith as perfectionists, they believed that if they truly believed and had true faith, then the Holy Spirit would prevent them from being sick um, up with this cholera. And so you had people that would wake up in the morning fine and have to go out and work and then be dead by nightfall. And it was really, um, it was not the way to practice medicine, um, but it was really a harsh, harsh time. Um, but with that being said, they still continued to grow and build. 1850, Jansen has a conflict with um, his son-in-law, interesting, no, cousin, he's married his cousin. Sorry, yeah, thank you. Get things thrown at me. Um, but, uh, get shot in Cambridge at the church. So this was, this was actually my interest in how I really wanted to explore Bishop Hills because I, I grew up in Cambridge. And so I knew that Eric Jansen died in Cambridge, but I didn't know that much more beyond that. And so that's, 
the path that I took to explore this interesting kind of history as a Cambridge resident. Um, but the death of Jansen, the colony has to take an idea. I don't know if I want the next slide or not. Um, I think the important, before we go to the next slide, the, the, the work had already begun, right? There was, they were still, they were, they were growing, they were planting, um, more colonists were coming over, and their success was already on the way. Even with these setbacks, um, they, they were growing and becoming the community they would become. So now we can, with the death of Jansen, um, the colony was chartered through the state of Illinois and became an official um, a colony, that's what they called it. So they had uh, trustees that ran the colony, everyone was a member, and everything was owned in common, right? So you got so many clothes every year, there was a big cafeteria that you could go and eat in. Um, but it was really started to become this economic machine for the prairie, and they would service and connect with um, farmers and others around the area. Uh, they were trading broom corn, you know, in Chicago. They were, um, they were investing widely. Um, they had outposts in, in um, Orion. They had fishing posts on the, on the river. Um, they helped found um, Galva. They brought the train lines through. I mean, this was a huge labor force of people that were opening up the prairie and really, um, you know, the craftsmen, and you, please go through all the museums that are here. I mean, these were people that had knowledge that they came over, and they came over and they were ready to work and really it exploded, um, exploded this area. We go to the next slide. But um, bankruptcy led to division. They had some bad investments. Um, the, there was a major um, economic downturn and as a result of the Crimean War that rippled through, and they lost a lot of money. They were in major debt. And so at that point, they decided to break up the colony um, to pay off debts. That was a huge, there's a lot of research on that. Huge, there's different camps on if we were going to stay together, if we were going to break up. Um, and actually, it's really interesting to think about, like, condo life invented in Bishop Hill because all of these rooms became owned by individual people. Like families got a share of the property of the colony and people for you know decades lived in a room in the steeple building um, for years to come. So it was really fascinating um, that, that, but the, the final lawsuits didn't end until 1879, right? Like it was a whole long drawn out battle. And oh, one more thing, I do want to acknowledge, I think this is a h interesting point in the history and thinking about um, because, like the story of Americanization is they sent a regiment of troops to the Civil War. So they arrived in 1846, but by 1860, they felt compelled enough to send troops to go fight um, for the Northern cause, which um, I think is interesting um, for people that hadn't been here for all that long and are not, you know, are fairly isolated compared to how we would think of things today. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, this idea of salvation and the debates that came over um, from Sweden. There's three people, we can go to the next slide, three people that I would like to focus on. Um, and they are Eric Jansen from Bishop Hill, of course, um, Jonas Hedstrom, who I mentioned, and Lars Paul Esbjorn, who founded um, the Augustana Lutheran Senate and is also the first president of Augustana College. Before I do that, I just want to set the stage a little bit. Bishop Hill was, there's a flow of people that came through Bishop Hill. Um, there's a lot of debates on how many people lived here at any one time, how many total people came over, but definitely there were people that came to Bishop Hill who didn't intend to stay in Bishop Hill. And in fact, um, you know, Eric Jansen's brother Jan made it to Chicago and didn't come with them the rest of the way. He was kind of like, I'm good, see you later, and you guys go on off and see how it goes. Um, but um, I, the important point with all of this is that it's, you know, there's estimated like 1,200 people came to Bishop Hill. Roughly, you know, 500 to 700 actually lived in Bishop Hill at any one time. There were 500 people that signed the charter, give or take, that when, the, when they chartered with the state. Um, but so there was, this, there was this growth of this community, right? And not just the Bishop Hill as a community, but the Swedish community across Western Illinois. And especially after the first wave of immigrants came through Bishop Hill, and then they started to see other immigrants going, the ones that, that ran for it in Victoria or Andover, people would directly come to Victoria and directly come to Andover and not come through Bishop Hill. So there was this growth across the prairie of, of these different communities. So that's the backdrop of that. So let's start with um, Jansen. Um, again, his theology was born of this devotionalism. And Jonas Olson, who actually um, became such a, a strong leader of the colony, um, was part of this movement um, before he had met Jansen. And they kind of became a partnership where Jansen became the prophet. Um, and and um, Jonas Olson really became a theological leader of Bishop Hill after Jansen's death. Um, again, influenced by Methodism. 
I love this idea. Uh, Mickelson talks about their goal was to find this, this pre-Constantine idea of Christianity, right? So before Christianity was absorbed as the official faith of the, of the Roman Empire, what was it like to be Christian, to live in common, a small C, small C kind of Christian um, as a community that supports them, themselves? And that's what they saw as like returning Christianity to this ancient way of Christianity. Um, I mentioned a little bit of this, but their the, this theology was this idea of perfectionism, that we can harness the gifts of the Holy Spirit now through pure faith. Like real believers could draw on that and be perfect um, through, through their belief. Um, and definitely, this is a very um, Lutheran thing, inher- rejected the idea of inherited sinfulness. So the idea that we're born sinners and we must seek forgiveness, that was out the window for the Jansenists, right? No, we can be perf- perfectionists, we can be perfect now with real faith. Um, and I think it's pretty fair to say that after Jansen's death, um, Olson continued on, um, in some way, um, this belief of Jansen's, right? He became the religious leader. Um, they never had really ministers that were going to go out. It was a very um, of the people kind of Christian um, practice. And just, this is the, I just love this quote. Um, this is um, according, this is a Jansen's quote. Um, it is writ that whoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive, all things are possible to him. That believeth, if ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do. So saying, you know, if you really believe and you ask in my name, you will have it. That's what God said to Eric Jansen when he was 22 and struck down um, in a field before he came over. That was his moment of conversion. So um, I, I do think there's an interesting idea. And again, this is me getting on some thin ice with what my, where my real expertise should lie um, to compare Jansen and Luther. And so this idea of faith is super important between both. And, um, and it's also very dangerous to summarize anyone's theology in a few bullet points. So, you know, I just take that with a grain of salt. Um, but the idea for Luther, right, was that grace came from God and he was, re- he was moving against the idea, um, the, the, you know, Roman Catholicism of good works at the time. Good works could get you to grace, but you had to be a believer and that you couldn't earn your way to grace, but it was through faith and belief that got you to grace. Um, and again, we're always in this idea, this, we're always going to fail. We're always going to sin. We always have to seek forgiveness where, um, Jansen was a move away from that. But in some ways, Jansen was a move with that because the focus of faith was so important for Jansen. So if, if you had that true faith, you wouldn't be sinful and then you could, you could receive that grace. So I think there's, to me, it's really interesting comparison. You know, is this a reaction against Lutheranism? Is this an extension of Lutheranism? Both of them, neither of them were advocating for this work of like buying your way to heaven or doing good works to get your way into heaven. So, um, so I think it's definitely fair to say that in Bishop Hill, there were true believers, right? There were people that were Jansenists and some people say, you know, really into the 1880s, there were Jansenists and maybe beyond, um, in Bishop Hill. But it's also fair to say that, um, people used the Jansenists as an avenue to get to the new world and then jumped ship as soon as they could. Some stayed in New York. Some stayed, um, some stayed in Chicago, some got here and headed to Victoria, right? And they, they really broke up. Um, there were some people that were locked into communal living. And I think this is something important to acknowledge, especially women. Like it was not easy to go out on your own, um, period, if you had no, no belongings. But there were some people that probably wanted to get away and couldn't. And they were part of the society and then supported the colony. Um, and Jansen did expect to build his, you know, Eden on the prairie and thought he would attract Americans to his faith and that never, you know, really happened. So, and it also partly didn't happen because he was murdered, but you know, um, that doesn't get in the way of true prophets, I guess. So let's talk just a little bit about Jonas Hedstrom. Um, So again, Hedstrom came with his brother in 1833. He converted to Methodism. His real job, his main job, I don't know what his main job, he was a blacksmith um, and he was a co-founder of Victoria. Um, His theology was tied to Wesley. So he had this perfectionist tract um, but um, Wesley in, in Methodism, and again, a long history here, um, he focused on that sinless perfectionism could happen, but Wesley also hedged a little bit, right? That we would always be um, f- failing and seeking forgiveness, failing, seeking forgiveness. Um, Hedstrom claimed, you know, faithful are free of sin and holiness can come from sinlessness. So living in sinlessness is how you find holiness. So, um, 
Importantly, right, um, Hedstrom founded the first Swedish Methodist church, and that spread. He was actually super um, successful. It spread across the area, um, and he really, you know, he preached for 20 years. And in comparison to um, Jansen and Esbjorn, he probably had a more successful ministry. Um, you know, Esbjorn, has, I think, did some significant things, but he went back to Sweden, came back, um, was a was a uh, was at Illinois State for a while, and then he founded Augustana, and so he wasn't out actually preaching um, as much as Hedstrom. So Hedstrom was kind of the boots on the ground minister for for many many years. Once the Swedes started to get um, established here, there were several calls back, <laughs> and, and um, Olaf Olaf Beck was um, not a happy person. His wife um, was was uh, captured by the Jansenists, so he would say, um, and he wanted to get her back. And so he was writing back to Sweden these letters. And I was like this one, talking about Jansen. I've been to visit Jansen four times and have seen that hellish place, talking about Bishop Hill. He and his followers lie both spiritually as well as in practice. He has not fled, as it was rumors. He owns everything in Bishop Hill in his name, and the rest of the cons colony, consisting of 400 souls, are his slaves. So, you know, this was... You know, um, Beck was not pulling punches when he sent letters back to Sweden. And a, a, a letter that was um, translated by Norton in the 70s was, um, you know, we are in great need of a teacher. This is a, a letter to Lars Paul Esbjorn calling for a Lutheran pastor to come. There are, there are Lutherans here. We want to come back to the church. We need, um, we need our shepherd to come. And this is one of the things that helped convince Esbjorn to make the trip across. Um, you know, Esbjorn in Sweden was not what you'd call necessarily the ideal Lutheran minister. Like, he actually flirted a little bit with the devotionalist movement, um, was, uh, you know, part of the reader movement, and actually um, had his frustrations with the bureaucracy and the nature of the Lutheran church in Sweden. Um, and that's what helped drive him over. And he brought um, 150 people with him and again went to the Bethel ship just as the Swedes as the Bishop Hill Swedes had done he went to the Bethel ship of, of New York and was hoping to get support from the Hedstroms to make, make to support his ministry to come here and they said yeah we'll support we'll support you but you need to convert to Methodism and um, there you know in in the letters he wrote he left behind I you know as Bjorn thought about it as Bjorn thought this would be an avenue to support it I was Flirting with Methodism in Sweden, so you know why not do it? And he actually, in the end, decided not to do it. He decided not to become Methodist, and that I think made it harder for him. But again, think about that moment in history. So, what would happen to the Augustana Lutheran Synod, which became a, a huge synod, um, became part of the ELCA Lutheran Church, if Lars Esbjorn had become a Methodist? Like, what what does that look like? And I, again, how much does one person impact the the momentum of history? I don't know, but it's an interesting thing to think about. Um, if he would have decided not to do that. Um, anyway, he has a very kind of standard Lutheran theology, right? Saints and sinners um, seeking forgiveness, um, that we will fall back into sin. We must seek forgiveness um, in order uh, and, and uh, follow faith. So um, so Voices from the Garden, I'm just doing, I'm like full of commercials. A really great essay um, by Dr. Fogdi in, a, in a, the Nobler Things to View book that the Heritage Association put out um, explores all of this theology if you wanted to, um, read a little bit more on this, and this is the title of it, so I'm stealing that from him. So I, I want to talk about like the interactions between um, these these men. Uh, when um, when the Jansenists arrived, there were a number that left right away. Right, some say it wasn't too many, maybe just 20. Some say as many as 200 um, left Bishop Hill and went to Victoria. Um, Hedstrom stole them away. There was um, a famous. Um, debate that was supposed to last three days in the colony church or colony church um, and Jansen and Hedstrom got in such an argument that it didn't really even last one day before Hedstrom was so angry that he left right um, in letters back home um, to as back to Sweden to uh, Hedstrom calls um, Jansen an idiot to a letter to Esbjorn so there was definitely harsh feelings um, between Hedstrom and Jansen, even though Hedstrom helped um, get Jansen here and get things established, right? Um, the, definitely Hedstrom you know, thought that the Jansenists were not following the right path. Like they were not following the true scripture, and you can guarantee that Jansen felt the same right, about, about Hedstrom. Um, this is from the Aurora Beacon from 1847. 
Um, the colonists were persecuted. A reverend justice of the peace, who was Hedstrom, is among their persecutors. And this is guys basically saying, ah, they seem fine to me. Those, you know, the Bishop Hill folks, they seem all good. Um, but even so much that the, the debates were reaching, you know, newspapers uh, around uh, what's today Chicagoland, for sure. Um, Hedstrom and Esbjorn have an interesting history together. There's a famous time where um, Esbjorn would, w went out um, to preach around the area of Andover, and by the time he got back, he found that Hedstrom had stopped in Andover and stole people away, and people were coming to move to Victoria because it seemed so much better. Um, but um, Hedstrom, in, in his letters, seemed to be a little nervous about Esbjorn arriving, having a Lutheran minister come. He was nervous about what that would do to his ministry, right? Did not seem very excited about that. Um, when, and again, I mentioned this, that there was conflict in New York with Esbjorn and Olaf Hedstrom um, when he first arrived, trying to decide, you know, do I convert, do I not? And when he wouldn't convert, he didn't get support. Um, and so Esbjorn lost a lot of people to, um, from Andover to Hedstrom. And, um, you know, I love this. Hedstrom says there's no real Christianity that exists anywhere in Sweden. So, again, undercutting um, the value of, of the Lutheran church. This, to me, is really a really interesting thing, is that in Sweden, Esbjorn was flirting with Methodism. It seems great. And, you know, Dr. Fogdi would say it took Esbjorn coming, coming to America to actually become a Lutheran. <laughs> and this... This quote is great. I came here to the U.S. with great confidence in Methodism, and it is only through the bitterest kind of experience that my eyes have finally been opened to the wretchedness and sectarianism of this system. So he came here and actually became more Lutheran than he might have if he stayed in Sweden. And I think it's interesting, right, because in Sweden, the Lutheran church was that kind of bureaucratic arm of the government, where here it was about you know, the theology, it was about the belief, and it was about the struggle of ideas with people on the prairie. Um, by many of the people here who had come to, Sweden, come to America, not necessarily because of salvation, but seeking that economic life, they saw Esbjorn as a genuine pastor. Like this was a real pastor, trained, someone that I can follow and go, and that helped him build his thing, build his ministry. Um, Jansen and Esbjorn never, that I know of, actually were, um, spoke to each other directly. But there is no doubt um, that, that Jansen influenced Esbjorn. I don't know if Esbjorn influenced Jansen as much. Esbjorn had impact on the colony after Jansen was gone, I would say, because Esbjorn arrived in the 1850s, after, or 18, in 1850, after um, Jansen had already been murdered. Um, but the, the Jansenists were from Esbjorn's parish. He knew many of them. And um, definitely had thoughts and had feelings about the Jansenists, right? So um, interestingly, there were some Jansenists that went with Esbjorn, but not that many. Many of the people that were really coming over with Jansen um, were not seeking Lutheranism as their way. They were finding other ways. And many became Methodists, many became um, Adventists uh, down the road. And in fact, there hasn't been, um, well, Lily said it all, has mentioned that there might have been a short-lived Lutheran parish in Bishop Hill, but um, you know, for decades there hasn't been a Lutheran church in Bishop Hill, the Methodist church, and there's been Adventist uh, communities, things like that. So, Anyway, so this is where we are, right? So Victoria, Bishop Hill, Andover, Quad Cities. Um, the, the, the foundations of this area, right, it wasn't just that people showed up and started farming, but that there were debates about meaning happening um, on the prairie. And depending on how you were part of those debate, debates might help determine where you decided to settle. Do you come to Bishop Hill? Do you go to Victoria? Do you go to Andover? And as more and more Swedes came over, that became more, like, more widespread. You could pick different places. But definitely early on, you would have to really think long and hard, am I going to be at Bishop Hill as a colonist? Am I going to show up to Andover? Am I going to show up um, with Hedstrom in, in Victoria. So there were many family bonds that were broken. There were um, disagreements that came with, but also there was this growth. And this is, you know, this is the foundations of many institutions that are still with us today. And this is, you know, like, right, my, my interest, right, growing up as a kid in Cambridge at a Lutheran church that was originally part of the Augustana Senate, going to Augustana College. These are institutions that have been handed down from here, coming over to Bishop Hill in fourth grade, um, being a, you know, eating hardtack as a, as a colonist um, it, when, uh, when we would do that from, from our grade school, right? These are institutions that 
um, carry with us, that we still um, are with us right now. So, yes. so let's talk about kind of how we think about this, this history. Um, I think Bishop Hill is so important for so many reasons, right? For the, for the culture that it provides, um, for the, the arts and the, the impact on this area. So again, thank you to the Heritage Association for what you do. Um, but you know, when, when you think about the history, you can say certain things. These people showed up, um, they built some towns, and you know, like in Bishop Hill's case, they disbanded. And I think how we think about that, the meanings that we give to that, are the most interesting thing. And this is the role of history. And history so much isn't about what happened then, but how history teaches us about what we are today and where we come from. So I want to talk about some of the different meanings. I think number one, we can't forget, um, this was part of a kind of European conquest, right? The, the Native Americans have been pushed off this land. We had discovered this Eden, and um, this we were out to um, Christianize America. And I think Bishop Hill is part of that conversation um, for sure. Um, and we, the Swedes at that time, and those of us today, we still benefit from that and, and should acknowledge that. Um, second is that Bishop Hill was this, uh, this uh, utopian um, community trying to find the perfect um, Eden on the prairie. And there's many of those, including the Mormons at Nauvoo, locally in Illinois. Um, they were in contact with the Shakers in Kentucky. The Amana colonies in Iowa are another example. So how do we live and how do we find this perfect kind of environment? How do we build a society is definitely a conversation that we've had in America, and Bishop Hill is part of that conversation. Um, again, the communist, but not Marxist, I always like that. Um, I think I might have stole that from Dr. Calder. Um, but the the idea, this is big brick, which no longer exists. Um, this is the big apartment complex that burnt in the 1820s. Um, one of the largest structures like east of Chicago or something like just amazing. I wish this is a building that I wish had been preserved. I mean, just um, where families live together, huge dining hall. I mean, nothing like it um, existed. And it, it definitely at that time and even even up to the present. But this experiment in communal living and how do we take care of each other and form communities and you know we have this story of the prairie of you know we're going to get our wagon and we're going to go out and we're going to find our our land but there's actually many communal um settlements where they decide to do this we're going to live in common and i'm not just talking like hip hippies from 1967 going out right in california but even across the prairie um, across the development of America, where there were experiments about how we can live together. Not all of them were successful, but I do think it's interesting um, the stories that we tell and how Bishop Hill is a commentary against some of the traditional stories that are out there. Um, but if we're also if we're communists, there's no doubt that the Bishop Hill colonists were capitalists, 100%. Right? They went to work and they made money. And they made a lot of money, and they they owned land and they had huge impact. And they again, I, I talked about some of this, but the colony was um, a capitalistic enterprise selling across different markets. And I think also ironically, maybe not ironically, but maybe appropriately, their failure was also a failure connected to capitalism, right? Like they went bankrupt because of bad investments. And so they kind of were the full capitalist circle and then had to decide you know, how they were going um, to move forward. The story about immigration I think is, is, is one that we can tell in different ways. There's a standard story. And, you know, some of the, the letters that you read from Bishop Hill colonists, if you would cross out Sweden and put in Mexico, it would read the same as some of the emails that friends of mine would have sent when their family came over, um, came up from Mexico, right? Like this is a, a, a traditional story of immigration where families brought family members over. Some family members went back. There was a back and forth. There was money sent back and forth to help. And we don't think about it now, um, or at least I maybe say, I don't think about it now, but the Swedes, especially in the early 20th century, you know, the Swedes that came over that were successful were sending money back to Sweden to help their family members come back over. And it sounds so familiar to the immigrant stories that we, that we tell. So some stories are standard. Some of this is, is, is just part of this growth of immigration that built um, the United States. One thing unique with Bishop Hill is they had a, this interesting pattern, is that when they faced conflict, they banded together. So in Sweden, when they had conflict with the church and with the government, you know, at one point, right, Eric Jansen was put in jail and he had to escape across to Norway. That's how he got on the boat to come over, is that he finally had enough and had to escape through the mountains. Um, but when that happened, they banded together, they came to America. When they came to America, they faced cholera, cholera and hardship, right? What did they do? 
They banded together and, and stayed strong. Eric Jansen was murdered, and the colony could have easily dissolved when Eric Jansen was murdered. Did he, did he, did they? No, they banded together and they built um, this huge economic engine. Um, but then some, but then at some point they went bankrupt and did they band together? So the Mormons, when their prophet was murdered, they banded together and moved to Utah. When the colonists here, when they went bankrupt, they could have banded together and headed west, um, but they didn't, right? They, they divided up the property and became Americans, right? And they, there's, a, there's a story of assimilation in there, of Americanization, that something to me, and I don't, this is an argument that I've made, is that somehow they changed, right? They, not, not only did they, did they break up the colony, but they sent a regiment to fight in the Civil War. They, they were so connected in with the debates that were happening at the time. So they, to me, they definitely did not see themselves as an as a isolated immigrant community, but part of a broader landscape. And they were willing to do their part um, in that war. So, and then this is just the last one. I think that there is a kind of diversity on the prairie. And, I, and, and you know, we use, t t we, I'm always a little nervous about using that word because we often use that word in, uh, in relation to um, ethnicity um, and race, and so I don't want to undercut that meaning of the word. But I do think that there was a lot of variation among beliefs of the people who were on, who, who came over. And those beliefs, that debate came from Sweden about what does it mean to be Swedish? What does it mean to be believers? How should we live our lives? And that came to the prairie and became the debates between those three leaders and other people that developed um, Western Illinois. So um, I think there's discussions about identity hidden in there. There's connections of, of religion, economics, community. Um, how does that work? So this is a kind of diversity on the prairie that I think uh, built up uh, Western Illinois. So to go back to the beginning, so why Rock Island? So I think answer number one is yes, Bishop Hill is partly why Augustana ended up in Rock Island. But it's also, you know, more than that, right? It's, it's a debate that started in Sweden. Um, it's this kind of diversity and this unique and sometimes not unique story of immigration that built what became um, Western Illinois. So with that, thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. There.